the, the reason I've dedicated, and it's almost 35 years now, is that, and this comes to how I became involved in the president. Uh, I saw uh, a number of UFOs. I was involved in a flap of UFO sightings in Carmen, Manitoba, Canada in 1975, two weeks after the end of the Vietnam War. I had my first sighting. This was near missile silos in North Dakota, the Minuteman three missile silos. And I had believed that the missile silos had been on alert because of the Vietnam War and the UFOs suddenly appeared. Because I'd asked people in the town, like, why are they coming to our little town in Canada? It was in the middle of nowhere. And I'd had a number of sightings. And what I did was I wrote a manuscript called Tales of Charlie Red Star. And I'd put it out and really the publishers, some of them read it. And I remember the local publisher who should have done it, because it was a big story where I came from, said, you may believe in this kind of stuff, count me among the unbelievers. And that was my rejection letter to my manuscript. So I had the manuscript and I said, well, this, this is something that I, I got to get, you know, I, I've seen it, I know what it is, and this is the, 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 the sort of the, um, the title of James Fox's new movie, I Know What I Saw. And I've told people that 150 times over the last 35 years, I know what I saw. Don't argue with me about UFOs, I know what I saw. I was, I was 50 feet away at one point of, of one of these objects. But anyway, so I, I knew what I saw and I knew that it was probably extraterrestrial, that this was something, my father's a pilot, my son's a pilot, I'm not stupid, I know what I saw and I wanted to get an answer to this thing. So when I got all these rejections on the manuscript and everybody just sort of listened to my sightings and said, oh, it's kind of interesting, so what else is new? I decided to go after the Canadian government and I went after the work of Wilbert B. Smith who had run the Canadian government program from 1950 to 1954. I talked to him, I pulled all the documents from, and he had hidden the documents away. When, when, before he died, he told his wife, hide the files, the government's coming. And the Russians came, the Americans came, and the Canadians came, all trying to get the documents, started breaking into the house. I recovered the documents, I found out where they were, filed the documents, and we came up with the, the famous document that David Rudy, I could talk to you about. Top secret document, UFOs, or flying saucers. He never used the word UFOs. He knew it was a, a term used, developed by the U.S. Air Force to throw people off. He always called them flying saucers. He said, flying saucers exist. Classification is the most highly classified subject in the United States. And there's a group headed by Vannevar Bush who's looking into it. And I went there and I found out that he was a contactee, that he actually claimed to be talking to them. He, we went through all this stuff. There was a bunch of other people that were involved in contacting them. Uh, and a particular a woman in Maine who had been contacted by the FBI, Navy Intelligence, uh, uh, Air Force, White House, uh, the same woman that he was using, and they all had contact with the alien by the name of Alpha. So anyway, I, I filed all that material, put it all sort of away, and it was very fascinating. A lot of people were very fascinated to find out the Canadian government was really into this and actually believed that this was going on and that the guy in charge of it was, was actually claimed to be talking to them. And that material led to... Uh, um, his correspondence, his, his meeting at the, at the um, Canadian Embassy in Washington where he got all this material. And the guy he got it from was Dr. Robert Saarbacher, who was a, uh, a sort of a military advisor to the Pentagon. And uh, later, years later, Stanton Friedman went back and found out this guy was still alive. This is in 1982, 1983. So Stanton talked to, to uh, Saarbacher and said, did you give this material to Wilbur Smith? And Saarbacher says, yeah, I recall giving it to him. And, and so he said, well, why was it classified? I have no idea. So I have no idea why they classified it so high. And he said, well, how did you know about this? He said, well, there was a series of briefings at Wright-Patterson Air Force Base. Something had crashed in the West, and we, a bunch of scientists, and I was invited to go out there to briefings that they were giving to the, the top military people, or the scientists. They were basically scientists and engineers. And so Stanton says, well, name the guys who, who, who went. You didn't go because he, he said he had been busy up in Canada working on the Dewline uh, radar and he couldn't go, but he said, well, who went? Who went? And he would name off uh, Vannevar, Vannevar Bush and he said, well, he's dead and Bronk and he would name all these different people and Stanton says, well, can you name anybody who's still alive? And he says, well, there's this one guy from Pennsylvania. I don't remember his name, but he's real arrogant. He thought he knew everything. And a bunch of research was done and they came up with the doc name of Dr. Eric Walker. Now this material, I, it was my second book, which was published, the first book that MUFON published. And it didn't go anywhere because MUFON, it was an in internal book, you couldn't buy it on the street. So MUFON published a thousand copies, a thousand copies were sold, it really didn't go anywhere. But uh, um, Richard Dolan, in his latest book that's coming out, will have a lot of, will revisit a lot of the material that was in that book. And what it basically is, 
is the, this guy, we tracked him down, and his name was Dr. Eric Walker. He was former president of Penn State University, the Ivy League Engineering College at State College, Pennsylvania. He'd been president there for 17 years. The president before him, who had, appoint, had given him the job as president, was Milton Eisenhower, who was the pre president's brother, who went, left State College or Penn State to go and work for the president, to advise the president, and Walker took over. And Walker knew everything. And based, he was the type of guy that when we phoned him, couldn't hang up the phone. So what we would do is, there was a bunch of researchers, I was sort of head of a team of researchers who contacted Walker from all over the world. And everybody would say, I can get him to talk. And that wasn't my thing. So I, I, okay, fine. And I would get all the transcripts of people talking to him and send him letters and stuff. And Walker was the type of guy who wanted to sort of play with the subject. He didn't want to talk to you about it. And he couldn't hang up the phone. People would get him on the phone and he would try to talk around it. but. He, uh, when you put all these transcripts and all these letters together, you could actually determine what he was talking about. And a lot of times he did confirm. For example, we asked him about MJ-12. He confirmed, yes, I've known of them for 40 years. Look, you're up against the windmills. Leave it alone. There's nothing you can do about it. And that was like days after the MJ-12 document came out. He basically confirmed, I've known of them for 40 years. That was 1987. And you take it back, it's 1947. So we, we put all this material in a book. And uh, Walker... Um, was contacted by a reporter. We figured this was gonna break the cover up because it was so dramatic, this material, and this was such a highly respected guy. He had been actually an assistant secretary of defense at one point in the United States. So the reporter went, and for the first time, Walker hung up the phone. He said, I deny it, Didn't ha I, 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 it's not true, and sorry I'm busy, and hung up the phone. So I said to my co-author, who was a, a journalist there, I said, well, is she going back? What's gonna happen? He said, no, she's not going back, and that was it. Nobody ever interviewed him again, and the story sort of died. So what happened then was I was looking for his files. From He was, he was the uh, assistant, the executive secretary of the Research and Development Board, which David Ridiak had been talking about. This is this top-level uh, group that developed weapons in the United States, and he was the executive director. So when the director wasn't there, he was the head guy on developing weapons at the Pentagon. He was at the E-ring. He was in the major part of the, uh, the main part of the Pentagon. And he had promised those files to the Truman Library. So that's how I got into the presidential thing. I was going after Walker's files. So I went to the Truman Library and they didn't have the files. And so while I was there, I said, well, what have you got on UFOs? And they said, well, we've got a couple of documents and they named a couple of pages, whatever. And I thought this is kind of strange, you know, this is uh, pretty important stuff. And about maybe 150 miles down the road is the Eisenhower Library in Kansas. So I was down there and I'm a long way from anything. So I decided to go to the Eisenhower Library. I went to the Eisenhower Library and you actually have to do an interview to, to research there. So the, they were doing the interview with me about what you're gonna research, whatever. And uh, so went into UFOs and they pulled the files and there was five documents. It's 30, 30 million pages of files and five documents. And at that point I said, this is the most important subject in the world. This is the most powerful guy in the world. The two have to go together. There has to be a connection. And I started at that point saying, what is the president, what is the most important powerful guy in the world know about the most important subject. And that's what led me going from library to library to library. And what I basically found in a lot of cases is there's really nothing there, which either means nothing happened or the president didn't know or they're able to keep the, the, the file secret. They're there, but they're keeping them secret, which I don't think is one of the possibilities. Because over the years as I've been to the presidential library, I've gotten to know a number of the archivists and I don't think the archivists are covering the thing up. Because, for example, the one guy at the Carter Library had heard the Jimmy Carter story in 1967. It was extremely interesting. We sat, we sat in the archives two hours after the archives closed, talking about UFOs. So these people were very interested, and he would actually send me material that I hadn't even requested. He'd say, I found this, and he would send it to me. But the thing was that there's very little in the, in the, in the, the libraries, which leads to the question that Bill Clinton, I'm probably not the first president to lie to, or that bureaucrats have tried to keep in the dark. Uh, the, the aspects I'm going to add is the presidential involvement in, in the Roswell thing. And uh, the first president I'm going to talk about is Harry Truman and his involvement. And I've spent a number of years trying to track uh, where, where Truman was at the time, where, uh, how he knew, what, all this sort of stuff. And very little because the presidential records weren't kept the same as they are now. There's a lot of blank spots, a lot of stuff wasn't recorded. 
And it basically, when I came to this convention, I lear learned a lot of stuff that I really hadn't known yet about the, the timelines uh, following the generals. And the one story I've sort of added, which is I think sort of a critical story, is the fact that uh, there was a number of people, Roswell witnesses, who were claimed that they were sworn to secrecy by the president. So what I'd do with each of those, I'd take the name of the person and I would check it against the presidential record. And with the presidential record, if you've met with the president, if you've spoken with the president on the phone, or if you've corresponded with the president, that's all recorded. You can take your name and you can see how many times this person, and none of these people were really checking. Then what happened was uh, a reporter out of Florida who does the UFO stories, Billy Cox, did a story about uh, Ben Games. And Ben Games was a guy who had a PhD, uh, was a major in the Air Force, uh, very prominent type guy, had come forward and told him a story that he had flown in uh, General Craigie, who was uh, a development of all the new aircraft in that time. Uh, out of Wright-Patterson, and he's claimed that he had flown Craigie into Roswell at, at that particular time when this was going on, and that Craigie had got into one of Blanchard's uh, cars and had taken off and said, make yourself scarce, I'm going to be busy, and really didn't tell what was going on, so Games went to the uh, officer's mess, heard the story of people telling about the, this crash that had just taken place and bodies and this sort of stuff. And uh, so when Craig comes back a number of hours later, he uh, said, well, fly me to Bowling Air Force Base. He's going to meet with the president. And according to Games, uh, Craig never told him what had happened, what he had been involved with, but his boss was, was uh, General LeMay. And there was always rumors that General LeMay had actually maybe had been at Roswell, was very involved in this whole thing. So anyway, he, uh, when, when I got this, then I was really curious. Like, all these people are being sworn to secrecy by the president, but the presidential record really didn't show any involvement by the president. They had shown that the president had been asked a UFO question, and there's only two presidents who have actually been asked a UFO question in a news conference, and one of them occurred two days after the Roswell news release on July the 10th. And the problem was they asked the wrong question. They asked him, uh, have you got any insides? And he said, only what I read in the newspaper, and the press dropped it. So when I, I, I wanted to find out, so what I did is I cr contacted Tom Carey, who is one of the people on the, the latest Roswell book, and their research is just incredible. Uh, I saw their lecture yesterday, and only twice in 35 years have I ever had a feeling that this thing may actually break open, that this thing may, uh, there, there may be enough evidence to actually end the cover-up. And yesterday I had that feeling. The other time I had that feeling was in 1978 when I saw Len Stringfield lecture in Dayton, Ohio when the first mentions of dead alien bodies, when he started to talk about dead alien bodies. But it, very impressive. So I, I contacted Tom Carey and I said, well, there's these witnesses who are saying that the president swore them to secrecy, but I can't find any record in the presidential library that these people ever had any contact with the president. So Tom wrote me back and said, well, it wasn't the president, it was the Secret Service that was swearing people to secrecy. So I said, well, have you got any names? So he gave me two names and I still remember I went and, and I know how to check this. I went to the presidential records and I started to check and I can still remember when I found it and it was like the shivers went up my back. It was unbelievable. It was the name they had given me was Gerald McCann, McCann M-C-C-A-N-N. -N. Gerald McCann had been swearing people to secrecy in Roswell at the time on behalf of the President of the United States. And sure enough, Gerald McCann was a Secret Service agent from 1944 till Truman left office. Now you, you, to find out after that whether he was with Eisenhower, you'd have to go with Eisenhower. but. It, it just was unbelievable that no witness would have been able to make up and guess a name like that. The second president I talk about when I'm here uh, in connection with Roswell was Ronald Reagan. And Ronald Reagan was, was fascinated with the UFO subject. Uh, he had, that I documented, two UFO sightings. And Ronald Reagan was the type of guy who liked, he, he was an actor, he knew where to stand, he knew how to do things with backdrops and stuff like this. And if you remember, he went to the Berlin Wall to make the speech, Gorbachev tear down this wall. And when he was uh, president, he asked Steven Spielberg to come to the White House. And in the White House uh, theater, they screened E.T. the Extraterrestrial. And one of the stories, and I, I checked this, I went to the library and got one photograph, they'd only released one photograph. Uh, during that, brie that, that um, screening, according to a producer by the name of Jamie, Jamie Chandray, Steven Spielberg told him in Japan 
that near the end Reagan had leaned over and said, I bet you there aren't six people in this whole room who know how true this whole thing is. And Spielberg was shocked. And, and since then, a number of people, Billy Cox, myself, numerous people have tried to contact Spielberg to get him to confirm the story. Did Reagan tell you this? And it's only in the last year that I've got a second confirmation from, and I haven't been told of the name, but a major Hollywood producer who claims, yes, he saw my website, they went to it, and they said, yes, Steven Spielberg told me the same story. So anyway, Steven Spielberg uh, shows this movie, E.T. the Extraterrestrial. This is in June of 1982. Three months later, and the, uh, you re you'll have to remember, the Roswell book came out in 79-80 by Moore and Berlitz. So the Roswell story was pretty popular back then. And here, Ronald Reagan, three months after seeing E.T., suddenly appears at the Roswell um, uh, airport. And right in front of Hangar 84, he makes a speech. And he's, on, he's, he's speaking with... Uh, uh, Schmidt, who was the uh, Harrison Schmidt, who was uh, Apollo 17 astronaut, and he makes an ET joke. He makes a joke about ET at the beginning of the speech. And uh, uh, Colonel um, or Colin Powell had numerous times told stories, and he had told to a, a presidential biographer that Reagan was always trying to talk about ETs in speeches. And his job as as his security advisor was to try to keep the uh, the stuff out of the speeches. And this is this is in writing where he, he said this. So Reagan makes this speech in front of the Hangar 84, and it's typical Reagan. He, he gets it out there and uh, was fascinated. The third president I'm going to talk about here is, is the most, I think, the most important when it comes to Roswell, and that was Bill Clinton. And Bill Clinton, if he, he had uh, a meeting, uh, a discussion with Paul Davids, the producer of Roswell, and Paul Davids, he told Paul Davids straight to his face, I'm fascinated in this stuff. And his, his involvement was, was kind of lengthy. Uh, what had happened there was, at the beginning of his administration, he, he was interested, and I had given a lecture in Eureka Springs, Arkansas. And I had a woman come up to me at the end of the lecture, and it was one of these things where I said, can you promise to write me? She was an older lady, uh, very respectable older lady, and she said, um, I can tell you why the Clintons are interested in UFOs. And I said, well, tell me. She says, well, my sister owns the famous restaurant that the Clintons hung out in. And uh, I said, yeah. And she said, well, what happened was, and I'm not sure whether it was Bill and Hillary or somebody very close to Bill and Hillary, but when they were at the restaurant, they saw something. So Bill had this, Bill and Hillary ha had this interest in, in UFOs, and they got into the White House, and as the stories have been told, uh, they took, got Webster Hubble, who was, uh, worked with Hillary Clinton in, at the Rose Law Firm in Little Rock, and he said, if I put you over there in justice, he made him assistant attorney general, he said, if I put you over there in justice, I want you to do two things for me. Find out, number one, uh, who killed JFK, because he was fascinated with JFK, he, he thought he was the second JFK, and he said, uh, are there UFOs? So he had, this, he had this thing started where he was trying to get the, the information. I had one researcher told me that he would drag admirals into the, into the room and say, uh, tell me what you know about UFOs. And the admiral would sort of look at him like, what planet are you from? Like, I don't know what's going on. And uh, so Clinton was interested. And then what happened was Lawrence Rockefeller, who was a, a billionaire, uh, and he was sort of the Rockefeller brother who was the humanitarian. He, he was the guy who was... Uh, he had to have philosophy degree from Princeton, was very much into uh, the ecology, was into paranormal phenomena, this sort of stuff. And he decided whoever the next president's going to be, whether it's Bush or whether it's uh, uh, Clinton, he's going to go and get this guy to disclose. So when Clinton gets elected, Rockefeller makes his way to the, to the White House. And as he told um, uh, researchers like Bud Hopkins, he was just going to go tell the president. And Bud Hopkins says, well, that's not how it works. You can't just go and tell the president to disclose. And what happened was he was cut off at the pass by the science advisor. They, they stuck him with the science advisor who was John Gibbons, Dr. John Gibbons. And so he went into John Gibbons and he says, I think we need disclosure. And John Gibbons, because he's a big uh, Democrat fundraiser, you know, he's got lots of money, you can't just sort of slough this guy off. So they said, okay, well, what do you want us to do? And he said, well, it's a massive conspiracy. All this is going on, and you got to get to the bottom of this. And so Gibbons, and, and what happened was, during the Clinton administration, I filed a Freedom Information Act request with the Office of Science and Technology Policy, which is the Office of the Science Advisor to the President. And because one other 
researcher had filed, uh, Bruce McAbee, and he'd gotten 500 pages. So I said, well, I, I'm doing the president, so I want to see these 500 pages. So when my requests come back, I got 1,000 pages. And so this whole story of what is now called the Rockefeller Initiative is detailed in these 1,000 pages of documents. So uh, in this story is told in the documents about Rockefeller coming in and, and describing the fact that it's a massive cover-up. And Gibbons writes back to him and talks to him and says, well, if the conspiracy is, is as deep as you say it is and as classified as you say it is, we'll have no chance to get to the bottom of this thing. What we should do is let's just take one case, let's get that case declassified, and then we'll go after the rest of it. And so Rockefeller, I guess, thinks about it and writes back and says, yeah, okay, we'll take Roswell. And that's why in the Clinton administration, when it first started, the Clintons put out the order, and a lot of people say it was the Air Force or it was uh, through uh, Schiff, but Clinton had a lot of power to greenlight this study. So the U.S. Air Force was told out to go and reinvestigate Roswell. So they start the investigation and they go and they do their, their thing. And one of the things that Rockefeller had asked for was uh, clearance, or like, uh, clearance for anybody who was going to talk that they wouldn't be prosecuted. And there is, in 1994, there was actually a, a document put out which said that anybody, a witness from Roswell, could uh, bypass their security clearances and could talk about it, and they wouldn't be prosecuted. So they, they, they get the report, a preliminary report for the Roswell study was put out in 1994. The final report was put out in late 1995. So the report comes back, and Clinton gets the report. Now this we know by sort of putting pieces together. He goes to Belfast, Northern Ireland, and he makes a speech, and he's lighting the Christmas tree. This is November the 30th, 1995. And in this speech, there's a, a, a letter writing competition in Ireland for kids to write letters to the president. Now, the two kids who won the letter writing competition were sitting on the stage with Bill Clinton, but he didn't read their letter. He read a letter, and I went to the Clinton Library when they released the files uh, uh, about a, two years ago, and I asked, where's this letter? And they can't find it, which makes me wonder whether the letter actually was made up by, by the president. And w what is important to note is anything goes into a presidential speech is there for a reason. I've studied enough presidential speeches. I know every single word is checked. It goes, uh, a State of the Union address will go through 30 different drafts. Every agency have to sign off on, the, on that presidential. So if it's in the speech, it's there for a reason. And if you see the actual clip when, when, when Clinton releases this, he's reading it very carefully. He's reading it from a script. He's not off the top of his head. And what happens was they don't read the letter from the two kids who won the letter writing competition who were sitting on the stage with Clinton. They read a letter from Ryan. And what Clinton says is, Ryan, if you're out there in the audience tonight, here's the answer to your question. No, as far as I know, a UFO did not crash in Roswell, New Mexico. But if they did recover bodies, they didn't tell me about it, and I want to know. Now, the reason he said that, and this, this clip came out and nobody really picked it up, was the first Roswell report released in 1995 didn't talk about the bodies, had no mention of the bodies. And what Clinton is doing is he's saying, I read the study and you didn't talk about the bodies. You explain to me what happened, what's with the bodies. So the Air Force goes out and does a second Roswell report, and that's why there's two Roswell reports. So in 1997, they release a second Roswell report called Case Closed. And there's the one where they talk about dropping the dummies out of the plane, and this, the people misidentified, they got the, the, the date screwed up, and that's the explanation to the body. So this report goes back and it sort of says to Clinton, here it is, here's the answer to your question, here's the answer to the bodies. And so uh, Clinton sort of just sort of gives up on it, although Rockefeller does go to the, uh, the Clintons, and he, he's sort of getting frustrated. He's, he's going back and forth to the science advisor, and was, one of the interesting things to note is he, he's always got this letter the Rockefeller's drafting, and it's a letter on disclosure to the president. It basically outlines what what he wants to to get across. And a number of people helped him edit the letter. One was John Gibbons, who's a science advisor. And there's actually in the presidential file, there's actually you can see the handwritten uh, notations from Gibbons on the on the columns, making recommendations, change this, do that, whatever. One of the people that he'd asked for to edit it was uh, Billy Graham. And Billy Graham didn't really want to get involved because he said, I've got a, you know, I've dealt with a lot of presidents and I really don't want to, I agree with your issue, but I really don't want to get into it. But the other person who helped edit the letter, and we actually have a document that, that verifies this, was Hillary Clinton. Hillary Clinton looked over this document. So here's Hillary Clinton, the, the uh, first lady, editing a letter on UFO disclosure to the president. And Rockefeller is getting sort of very upset. Every time he wouldn't get what he wanted, he would say, okay, I think it's time to write the letter to the president. And then they'd go, oh, no, 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 hang on. And, and they would do whatever he wanted to do. And so they tried to help him. 
So in 95, I guess Rockefeller gets upset and he decides he's going to the president. He wants a meeting with the president. So the president goes to Rockefeller's ranch and this is in 1995 before the 2006 campaign. And what happens is Clinton is seen as a sort of an elitist type guy. You know, he hangs out in Martha's Vineyard for his holidays and stuff like this. And so what they do is they agree to send him to the Rockefeller Ranch because it's backcountry Wyoming and he's going to go whitewater rafting and he's going to go camping. And Clinton said, like Dick Morris talks about, he hated it. He absolutely hated it. He didn't want to go there. He had no intention of camping and stuff like this. It just wasn't his lifestyle. But because they saw the swing voters in 1996 as being people who were techie people or people who were into the environment, he had to appeal to those people. Those would be the swing voters, and that's how he had to win the election. So they sent him there, and he, Rockefeller sits down with him, and he he does a, a personal briefing. It's not a briefing, but it's a, a, a citizen, and he goes through a pile of material that was provided to him by Stephen Greer, documents and stuff like this, and Bill and Hillary both sit and listen to the whole thing. They really don't say anything, and then according to Rock, what Rockefeller told Whitley Strieber, the next morning Hillary came up and said, okay, we've listened to you don't ever bring up the subject again. And so the, the subject sort of dies out there. But uh, Clinton has talked about Rockefeller, uh, about Roswell a number of times. And a couple of times he's talked about it when the question really didn't have anything to do with, uh, with uh, UFOs. He was asked on a, on a radio talk show out of, out of Houston. And the, the more famous one is one that's just been put on the internet. And it's still not public. This was the one that we got uh, Neil Gould, who out of uh, Hong Kong. Uh, I've been trying to get this for a number of years, this uh, uh, conversation, or it was an answer to a question. He had been, I think it was to a bank. He had been doing giving a speech to a bank in Hong Kong. And um, he had answered this, this question about uh, UFOs. And uh, I'd gone to the Clinton Library, and they'd sent me to the foundation, and the foundation really wasn't answering my letters, and I was trying to go. And so this thing is not public. It was sort of gotten, the, Neil Gould went, found somebody who was there, and they provided him a copy, but it's still not public. And in this, the, the guy asked him the question, I guess he must have been one of the powerful people who had set the thing up, and he said, well, as, as, as I have the position to do this, I'm going to ask you the question. And he said, uh, do presidents actually pass secrets from one president to another, like you and Jimmy Carter, or you and Bush. Is there a, a set of secrets that get passed from one president to another? For example, where's Jimmy Hoffa's body, or what happened at Roswell? And Clinton starts laughing, and he starts talking about this. And he said, yes, uh, I'll tell you. He said, in, do you remember Roswell? Do you remember the, the, the big anniversary that happened in 19, he, has a, he, he says 1998, but 1997. Uh, there's, you know, thousands of people from all over the world came there, and people were fascinated with this. And he says, I I'll, I'll admit, I actually tried to look into this, and I, I tried to get the documents and, and stuff. And then he starts talking about Area 51. And he doesn't mention Area 51 because they're still not supposed to use the term. But what he said was, there's a lot of people in my administration who thought that Roswell was garbage, that it, that it wasn't true. But a lot of them really believed that there was actually an alien and a, and a spaceship at this military base in Nevada, and he's talking about Area 51. So he said, I actually sent someone there to check it out. And he said uh, that we found out it was just a, a, mili a military establishment where they're doing top secret Air Force work. And then he goes again to talk about Roswell, that he really doesn't think Roswell happened, that he thinks there's uh, explanations for it. But on another, uh, a couple other occasions, it still shows that he does, he does know and he's still very interested. For example, there's the famous story about uh, Paul Davids. has had a, a, a long involvement with Clinton. And Paul Davids' involvement was that his father was uh, a professor at Georgetown University and taught Bill Clinton. So what happened in 19, this would be in 1996, uh, Paul Davids took all the Roswell material. He took his Roswell movie and he took a bunch of uh, uh, different stuff. The Roswell book. And the first Roswell book, uh, uh, and he sent it to the president. And he said he got an overnight letter back from the president saying, thank you for the material. I didn't mention what the material was. Thank you. I really appreciated it. You know, I liked your father and this sort of stuff. So this goes. And then what happens is the Monica Lewinsky thing breaks out in late 96, 97 or whatever. And the FBI does a study. And uh, the study, uh, they, they do an investigation. And what they're doing is they're looking for a book called Vox. And this is the phone sex book that Monica Lewinsky had sent to the president. So they're looking for this book, and they go to the pre and they, they get, uh, I guess, a search uh, to go into the president's personal library inside the Oval Office. And they pull all the books, and they put out the inventory of the books that were in the library. 
and they do find the Vox book. And the strange thing was, the book right next to the, the Vox book was UFO Crash at Roswell. So Clinton had it in his personal library. And then, uh, so what happened was Paul Davids, this is, this is going back to just last year, Hillary Clinton's running for uh, president, and the latest Roswell book by Kerry and Schmidt is out. So he decides the president's got to read this book. I got to him before, and he decides there's a, there's in, in the Hamptons, there's a fundraising breakfast for Hillary Clinton. And he decides, I'm going to this fundraiser, and I'm going to give this book to, Cl to, to Clinton, and I'm going to talk to him about this. So he, he doesn't know whether the Secret Service are going to stop him at the door because he's carrying a package, of course, and security and stuff. And he said it was very strange. He walked right in, and he takes pictures of himself with Hillary in the background and to prove that he was actually there. And the, the, it was a $15 million state. And, and Paul Davis, when he told me the story, and he's told it publicly, said that they told him, he said, I, I want to speak with Clinton. And they said, okay, here's what you, what, what you do. Bill will speak first. Bill will stand up and talk. And once Bill's finished talking, uh, Hillary's going to come up and talk. And as soon as Hillary's finished talking, Bill will be sitting at the back along these windows. Then you go and talk to Bill because everybody's going to be going after Hillary and asking her questions, and it'll be distracting. So that's exactly what he does. He waits, Hillary finishes, the applause starts, and he goes and he sits down beside Bill Clinton. And he pulls out the Roswell material. And he puts the Roswell book in front of uh, Bill, and he says, here's the, and it had the, the cover-up. And he said, I, he can still remember Bill looking down at this Roswell book and looking at this, this subtitle about the cover-up. And he just looked up and he said, you know, I'm fascinated in this stuff, and I'm going to read this. And so we, we know he was fascinated in it, he, he, for whatever reason, and he uh, green-lighted a number of studies. The other thing that he green-lighted that a lot of people don't know is his first CIA director was James Woseley. And James Woseley, and this is according to Stephen Greer, and we're trying to check this, but James Woseley isn't talking anymore. He and his wife, who's a very high-ranking scientific person uh, in Washington, in the late 1960s had a daylight UFO sighting in Maine. Was it Maine? It was on, on the East Coast there somewhere. And uh, Stephen Greer had spent three hours with the CIA director at a dinner party and had been told this and this sort of stuff. And uh, Stephen Greer is, is pressing the CIA director. Now, a lot of people say it wasn't a significant meeting, Greer distorted it, whatever. And I, I personally have requested, because we have a book, I have personally requested interviews with these various people. And one of them was the CIA director. And I got a phone call back from somebody in the CIA office saying, well, very interesting project. We wish you well, but we're not going to do an interview. So I know anybody sits down with a CIA director for three hours. I don't care if you're talking about knitting or what you're talking about. If you sat with a CIA director for three hours, that's important. So the CIA director said to him, Greer said, we need this release. We need you to have disclosure. And Wosley made a very important statement. He said, how can we disclose what we don't control? And so Wosley puts out a request for a new CIA study. And this is in, Greer meets with him in December of 1993. Mm -hmm. And this study did come out. Now, Wosley didn't stay around very long. He, I think he left in late 94, early 95. He's only there for a couple of years. He, he resigns, but this study does come out in 1997. And it's a study on a new UFO study by the CIA. And it talks about the 50 years of UFO investigations. And it's the one that comes out and says that most of the UFOs people are seeing were misidentifications of U-2 or SR-71s and stuff like that. So they whitewashed the study. But it was a study that was initiated by James Woseley. And I think Clinton, uh, as well, greenlighted this because there was a lot of different uh, people in the Clinton administration who seemed to be involved and seemed to be sort of pushing different issues and different things were, were coming out. And Clinton was very interested in, in uh, openness. Uh, he did have a, a, a close association with John Podesta, who was his chief of staff. And under the Clinton administration, with John Podesta's help, they actually uh, went into an openness thing where they said um, any UFO, not any UFO document, and the rumor was that they were trying to get the UFO documents, and by pushing all the documents out, the UFO documents would come out with it. And what they said, and this is an executive order in 1995 by Clinton, that basically said to the eight intelligence agencies that if, if, if the document is more than 25 years old, it has to be released, and unless you've got a really good reason. And the, the, the onus was on them, and that if there was a question as to whether they should release it or not release it, it should be released. The, 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 the public should get the, the upper hand. So they, they disclosed this, and what a lot of people don't know is that the Clinton administration 
declassified 800 million pages of files during their administration. So it, it, it's a, a, a situation, and the, the problem was that none of the UFO files came with it. There's a lot of stuff. And Clinton, uh, w one of the stories was that Clinton had tried to get it, and they hadn't got it. And one of the stories was that it was this, his psychological profile, that he had, uh, he had evaded the Vietnam War. He'd been going to school in, in, uh, in uh, Great Britain, and that uh, he had the first issue he had when he got into the White House was to uh, put gays in the military, which caused an insurrection in the Joint Chiefs of Staff. And one of them actually spoke to him, you know, and said that he totally disagreed with this. So Clinton was seen as sort of a left-wing guy that you really couldn't trust him. And that was always the story that they wouldn't tell Clinton because he couldn't keep his mouth shut. And one of the things that Clinton did when these files were coming out is he actually did open his mouth about another incident. And that was the, the uh, uh, plutonium thing where they were putting uh, radioactive material in food and stuff like this and this this story sort of broke that the intelligence agencies had been doing this kind of stuff so Clinton was the type of guy he was very open and even now uh, when people ask Bill Clinton a qu question about UFOs he doesn't walk away from it. most presidents most high-ranking people will slough the question off Bill Clinton will actually talk about it but if you listen very closely to him uh, you get the idea that he's still really not telling the truth for example when he was in Hong Kong Part of the answer to his question was, the guy said, w when he answered the question, the guy came back and said, well, is there a list or isn't there a list? And he said, well, you, you know, uh, if, if there was, I'm probably not the first president they lied to or that bureaucrats have waited out. And he said, if there is some bureaucrat holding these files somewhere, they, if, they, if they evaded me, and I'm almost embarrassed to say I tried to get to the bottom of it. So Clinton is an interesting guy, and I think if you if somebody uh, respectable were to get Clinton and to actually confront him and do a half-hour interview, I think you'd get a lot of material because Bill is pretty open. Even uh, Larry King had had stated, and this is 1994, and we haven't found out what the answer to it was. Uh, Larry King had a UFO sighting in 1972. He was working for the for the uh, Minnesota or the. Miami Dolphins had had a UFO sighting and he had been at Roswell in 1994 and uh, or at Area 51 he was and they were doing a show on Area 51 he'd done an interview with MUFON and in that interview he had said he told about his sighting and then he also said that I'm friends with Bill Clinton and Bill Clinton doesn't like secrecy and I'm going to ask Bill Clinton but we've never been able to get to Larry King to ask him did you ask Clinton and what did Clinton tell you so uh, it is a very interesting presidency, and he's one of the guys that tried to get to the bottom and wasn't able to. The other one that tried to get to the bottom of the whole thing and wasn't able to was Jimmy Carter. Now, as you know, Jimmy, Jimmy Carter, his involvement came from the fact that he had a UFO sighting. And the date given was 1969, but I've talked to an archivist at the uh, Carter Library who went to school with Jimmy Carter's son, and he said it was earlier. He said he, his, his, his son had told him the story, and he was sure it was earlier. Anyway, because he had this interest in, in he had had this sighting, in 1970, 1973, he actually filed a UFO uh, form where he detailed what had happened, signed the form, and it went, uh, I can't remember, it was a group out of uh, Oklahoma that he filed with. So when it comes to him being president, he's running for president, and on two different occasions, he talks about the fact that if he becomes president, he will release the UFO files. And so once he gets into the White House, and I went through his files, and a lot of people have been through his files to try to detail this, there are a number of initiatives that he does. For example, most people may not realize the, the FOIA uh, material that we have, the uh, UFO material, almost all of the material that we have was re released under the Carter administration. The FBI files, the CIA files, the uh, Defense Intelligence files, thousands and thousands of pages of files were released. And Jimmy Carter had the same sort of uh, uh, stance as Bill Clinton, that if, 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 the, if there was a toss-up as to whether to release it, it should be released. So a lot of this material was released under him, and he sent a bunch of people to try to figure out what was going on. His press secretary, who was Jody Powell, uh, went to the FBI and tried to find out from the FBI, how do you file UFO sightings, what do you have, all this sort of stuff. And the other one he had, he went to NASA. And Frank Press, I think was the, uh, uh, the science advisor, had gone to NASA and they wanted a new uh, investigation. 
They wanted NASA to take up a new investigation of UFOs, the same as Blue Book had done. And of course, what had happened, some of the background was that, that Carter had come in and he'd done some things he probably shouldn't have done. And one was he cut, I think, $5 billion from the NASA budget. So in one hand, he's cutting their budget. In the other hand, he's giving them this PR nightmare to take on the UFO thing. And NASA was very hesitant, but there's a lot of correspondence going back and forth about whether they were going to do this study. And then there was a document, a, a, a letter, a letter or whatever it was, it came from the CIA to NASA, which basically said, do not touch it. it said, don't touch it. And then they, they called it off and went back to the president and said, no, NASA doesn't want to do the study. But Jimmy Carter had his problem, I think, was that he came in and, like Bill Clinton, he wasn't really interested in uh, intelligence. And he fired a bunch of CIA people. And uh, he was in a situation where he really wasn't trusted. And I think, it's almost like Bill Clinton, there was a, sort of a, a group that was always trying to get him out. And I even heard this when I went to the, to the library, to the Carter Library. They told me the story that when Carter went in, and the same thing happened to Bill Clinton, they came from the South, and they ran as outsiders in Washington. So Jimmy Carter, for example, wore short sleeves when he was campaigning, which presidents never did. You always had your suit on. He'd take a suit off. He'd have short sleeves. He wanted to be the outside guy. He'd take his tie off. I'm one of you. I'm not a Washington insider, the same as Clinton had done. And so the problem was, and I've always said, if you're a Washington outsider and you win the election, don't be surprised if you go to Washington and you find out that the people who have the power, the money, and the knowledge don't talk to you. And that's what happened to, to, to uh, Carter. And even the archivist told me that there was a lot of comments. It was sort of like, who does this guy think he is? These people walk around in bare feet and eat with their hands, referring to people that come from Georgia. And this, this guy's the president. And so there was this backlash. Plus, they would bring all their people in from, from Georgia in terms of Carter and Clinton brought all his people in from Arkansas. So, and, and these Washington insiders really didn't like it. In fact, you, rem you probably recall uh, when Bill got into a lot of trouble with the Monica Lewinsky thing, Hillary Clinton was walking around talking about the vast right-wing conspiracy that was trying to get rid of her pres uh, the president. And I remember at the time I sort of laughed about it. And then after I'm thinking, maybe she had something. Maybe she was talking about this inside group, these powerful people who were actually try sabotaging the president on every initiative. So Carter had the problem the same as, as Bill Clinton, that he was a Washington outsider, and he really couldn't get to the bottom of the thing. And there was there's a number of stories about a briefing that he was that he was given. There was a uh, it was it a Secret Service agent? I think it was a Secret Service agent. There was a, a a researcher who had been told the story by the Secret Service agent that Jimmy Carter had been briefed, and that Jimmy Carter was totally broken up by what by, by what he had heard in the briefing, and uh, that uh, even one part that he had been crying. And uh, so I, I heard the tape, and but this guy is still around, and he was actually appointed by Bush as a top uh, person going into Iraq. So he was still a guy that was pretty powerful. They went back to him, and he denied the story. He said, no, he told stories about things that had happened, and, but no, I don't, no, that didn't happen. I wasn't in this briefing with Jimmy Carter. So it's always been very hard because the records have always been kept very secret as to which presidents have been briefed and which presidents haven't. The only thing I know for sure, I've, I can guess at a lot of stuff that Truman knew and that, that Eisenhower knew. The only thing I know, and, and, and I still haven't released the, the name of the guy, but I had a close friend who talked to me until I talked about this. And uh, he said, can't keep your damn mouth shut. And I said, well, you know, like, you know, whatever, because it was supposed to be confidential. But people do in ufology, they'll send you stuff and then tell you not to, to keep it quiet. But it was an important thing, and that was that he had talked to two presidents. And he was, had come to me looking for Jimmy Carter's phone number. And he had already talked, and he was tracking. One of the big stories I've always tracked is the Holloman Air Force Base film. And the rumored story was, and this was part of the story that had been told about Jimmy Carter by this Secret Service agent, was that part of the briefing for Jimmy Carter was a 15-minute was a color film of the Holloman Air Force Base landing. And it was very important, and it seemed to back up the fact that this guy was telling the truth, even though he denied it later, because this friend of mine had told me that he was looking for Jimmy Carter's phone number. He'd already talked to uh, uh, Ford, and he'd talked to uh, Bush Sr. And they had both confirmed to him, he'd asked them about briefings, and they'd both confirmed to him that they'd seen the Holloman Air Force Base film. And the Holloman Air Force Base film is a story that Bob Ammenegger, and I know Bob Ammenegger very well, I've talked to him, been with him numerous times, heard the story 20 times, is a story that happened in the Nixon administration where 
they were green-lighted a study, and they were basically given access to everybody. Everybody talked, all the Blue Book people talked, and they were given a film, and they had it in their possession. They had this film, and it, it purported to be a landing. There was three crafts had come in. The, the, uh, they had the film cameras were all set up at Holloman Air Force Base. They knew these things were coming in, and the, the, the one came down, the other two stayed up, and it landed on the tarmac, and a bunch of high-ranking officials came. These aliens came out of the, the spacecraft. This is all being filmed. And then they walked down the tarmac to a building on Mars Avenue at Holloman Air Force Base, and they, they had a meeting or whatever they did there. And so Bob Ammenegger had this film, and uh, the, these two presidents claimed to have seen this film. And this is what this fellow was actually researching. So he asked, um, for example, he asked uh, Ford, and that's the key thing is the briefing. He asked Ford, he said, well, when were you briefed? And Ford says, I'm not going to tell you. Don't even go there. I'm not telling you where I was briefed. And that's the whole thing, is if you give the briefing date, then you've got something to work with. Then you know what room they're in, because the presidential record is all there. And you can tell who was in the room. You know who the people to press. And you can force the briefing out, but un until you know when the briefing is. So it's always been hard to determine who got briefed and, and who didn't get briefed. Barack Obama has faced the UFO question on three different occasions. And uh, the first occasion that Barack Obama faced the question was uh, after one of Stephen Bassett's X-Files conferences, the Washington Post uh, went to all the different campaigns when Barack Obama was campaigning and asked them, are you going to end the, U the ET embargo on information? And uh, Obama's spokesman said, we're more interested in ending the, the uh, embargo on information coming out of Iraq. That was the first time. The second time was in October of 2007, Barack Obama was at a, uh, a, a uh, debate in Philadelphia. This is the famous one where uh, Kucinich is asked the UFO question, and Kucinich confirms that yes, he did see a UFO at Shirley MacLaine's house, and it was a UFO, what's the big deal? The very next question, they go from him, from the asking the question of Kucinich to Obama, and they ask him the question that all the astronauts of Apollo 11 all uh, have uh, said that they believe there's life outside of Earth. What's your position? And Barack Obama says, uh, I really don't know, and I don't pretend to know. What I do know is there's life here on Earth, and we're not taking care of it. And then he goes into the whole speech about the people that have to be taken care of. So he avoids the question. Then he's asked, and we believe, we haven't tracked it down, we have the video, but we believe it's a Chicago uh, reporter asks him the question, says, Mr. Bur Mr. Obama, if you get to the White House and you discover that there are ETs and the people haven't been told, will you tell the people? And he says, well, it depends what the aliens are like, whether they're Republicans or Democrats. So he basically evaded it. And then I guess there's one other story. Uh, a lot of people, Stephen Bassett had done a campaign to send letters to the... Uh, to the White House and a lot of different issues and, and Barack Obama put up this change.gov site where people would ask questions and stuff. So there's a lot of people asking UFO questions and they now have a, a website, the, the White House has a website where people can give their opinion on what they want and uh, so a lot of people are asking UFO questions. Now the woman that's running the, the website is uh, Becky, I can't remember her last name, but is running the site and she actually does describe the fact that uh, people who are asking UFO questions or other questions can talk among each other, which kind of amazed me. It's like the reason we're putting on it here is for you to read. We talk among each other all the time. You know, we don't need to talk among each other. And the one thing that she said was was very discouraging because the two big issues that were, that have been brought up, people asking questions, are the legalization of marijuana, and the other one is where's Barack Obama's birth certificate. So this woman, she, and she's out of the White House, said. Uh, the, the most popular issues aren't p potentially the most important, which basically says even if UFO people write millions of letters and it gets there, just because you have the most number of requests doesn't mean it's an important issue and we're going to answer it. So that's where it goes. Barack Obama is kind of a, uh, a guy who's more interested in other stuff. There's the very interesting connection with John Podesta, who was the X-Files guy in the uh, Clinton White House. And I know from from people who know, who've talked to John Podesta, and sh and the main one being Leslie Kane, who says that she does not believe that John Podesta has brought it up and will not bring up the issue. That they've got other things to do, and so it sort of dies there. That you think, well, 
they're, it's not an issue that they're really going to look at. Okay, I've been uh, researching the Roswell incident for about a dozen years now, or maybe 15 years. And uh, my, uh, what I'm best known for is analyzing a photograph of a, uh, a, a telegram, a military telegram that was in the hands of General Roger Ramey. Uh, and this is right in the midst of the Roswell incident. And uh, what happened is the uh, base in Roswell put out a press release that they'd recovered a flying saucer and uh, that they were flying the uh, pieces or whatever it was to Fort Worth, Texas, you know, to see General Ramey. And then uh, about an hour after the press release, General Ramey is saying, oh, it looks to me like it's a weather balloon. So that was uh, his basic story. And then an hour later, he brought in a photographer from the local newspaper and photographs were taken. And you can see in all the photographs, he's holding this slip of paper, but in one, the photographer just by chance happened to get an angle on the front of the paper and that's what's called the Ramey memo and uh, we've long wondered what might be on it and there's speculation that it was a new press release about weather balloons but uh, starting about a dozen years ago the photographer assembled a team and they started to take a look at it and they got blow-ups and uh, one of the words they picked out of there was victims and that got a lot of people like me interested in it and then we started looking at it and now we have a pretty good idea of what's in that, uh, that memo. And basically what it is, is uh, General Ramey is communicating with the Pentagon to General Hoyt Vandenberg, who's the uh, acting chief of staff there for the Army Air Force. And he's informing him as to what's happening and what they're planning. So what's happening is they, he says that they found a disc, okay? Um, which he may also describe as being a pod or an airfoil, it's a little unclear. Uh, and the victims of the wreck, you know, that they, that you, meaning Vandenberg, had forwarded to Fort Worth, Texas, possibly to some team there. And then there's the next paragraph, okay, that's what's happening, this is what we're doing about it. Well, they have the bodies, how are they getting them to Fort Worth? Well, they're flying them out, and maybe a C-47, maybe a B-29. We know of a B-29 flight the next day. We have the testimony of the crew and, and uh, one of the people who was guarding, you know, the loading of, the, uh, the, of this large crate into this box. And the crew said they got to Fort Worth and it was greeted by a mortician because one of the crew members knew the guy and knew he was a mortician. So that was, and it was, it was surrounded by an armed guard and chained into this B-29. So they all thought that was very peculiar. Plus they knew about the rumors of the crash saucer and the little men, you know, that had been recovered outside of town. So I think the, mem uh, the memo was talking about this flight the next day. They were still planning it. They didn't know how they were going to do it. So it says aviators in the disc, I think it says aviators, uh, they will ship, and I think it says to the flight surgeon at Fort Worth. Um, and then they're going to ship them by C-47 or B-29. And then the next, I think, is talking about, uh, well, okay, that's the bodies. What are they doing with the craft that they recovered? Well, I think it says that Wright Field, which is in Dayton, Ohio, where they had the aeronautical labs, they were going to assess this object at Roswell. And it has the words at Roswell in there. And then next it starts talking about, okay, now we're, this is how we're going to cover it up. This is how we're going to deal with it publicly. So at first it says uh, perhaps about noon, a counterintelligence team at Roswell, and we have witnesses there say there are all these strange Army counterintelligence guys running around. This counterintelligence team said uh, to, to send out a, what they called the misstate meaning of story, which we think is referring to the press release. In other words, they were giving part of the story, a little bit of truth, but they weren't telling the whole story of what was going on. And the press release said we recovered a flying disc, but didn't say what it was, didn't say exactly where, you know, didn't say anything about bodies or a, a disc or whatever. Um, so uh, that's the misstate meaning of the story. And then they said, and they think that the next press release of weather balloons, which was the new story that Ramey was putting out, would work better 
if they add photos of weather balloons, which Ramey was doing at right that moment, and then do balloon demonstrations afterwards. Okay, so, uh, and then we, I've been able to document a whole number of uh, military balloon demonstrations that followed in the next few days. In fact, they were openly bragging about it. Uh, they were saying, uh, you know, they were trying to kill the saucer report. So the Army and Navy was engaged in this, what they called a concentrated campaign to stop the rumors. So that, they were saying, we're debunking the saucers. I mean, they were very open about it. They weren't hiding it. So uh, that's the Ramey memo, and it's signed by Ramey. And I think the last part, he's, he's this, the counterintelligence team was saying, uh, we think we need to add visuals, okay, to uh, just a simple uh, re a release saying that, oh, it's just a weather balloon isn't going to convince anybody. We think we need photos. So that's why Ramey was had his weather balloon at his feet at that moment, if this photo was taken, and then why they had the balloon demos afterwards. Uh, so that's the Ramey memo, and it's a bit different from the modern Air Force story that, oh, it's just a mogul balloon, and, you know, and there weren't any bodies, and it's all exaggerated and made up. So that's, that's that. Okay, one of the interesting things is we've been able to trace um, things that were happening back at the Pentagon, particularly with General Vandenberg. Uh, there isn't anything I've been able to find with Truman. It all looks very clean and sanitary. But there were things going on with Vandenberg which are very suspicious, although you can't say, point and say that's a smoking gun like I would call the Ramey memo. Uh, and uh, Vandenberg's uh, involvement, public involvement uh, from you know, quotes in the newspaper started on July 5th. The, Ramey, the incident, you know, with the press release on the base was July 8th, the afternoon. So uh, Vandenberg is, is in uh, Texas at that time, which, is, which I thought was a little suspicious, but I think he was just doing a political favor for a congressman. He's returning to Washington on July 5th, and he's asked about the flying saucers. And one woman says, are they Russians? You know, do the Russians have the secret of the flying saucer? And he says, uh, well, we're, we're looking into it. We've received thousands of inquiries. You know, he says that. And we're, we've been looking into it intensively since, I think he said, July 2nd, maybe July 1st. So he admits that they're investigating. He doesn't say anything beyond that. Then he gets back to Washington, which would be, you know, this was the weekend, July 5th. July 7th is Monday. And there he is in his, um, his log, you know, which is in the Library of Congress. He's with General Curtis LeMay, who's the Deputy Director of Research and Development for the Army Air Force. And LeMay is briefing him on the flying disks because there's just all these reports in the newspapers and the Pentagon is obviously getting flooded with phone calls about it. So Vandenberg is personally taking calls from a newspaper in Canada asking what they are, and he's noncommittal. He's, there's a hoax dis story, crash dis story going on in Houston where somebody claims to have found a disc and it has Army Air Force, you know, printed on it. So he's trying, he is personally spending a lot of time with LeMay trying to kill that story, and he's telling his people, you know, he's calling his people in Houston and says, kill this story, do whatever you can to kill the story, which is itself kind of curious. And I sort of suspect that he already knew what was going on in Roswell. And he was afraid that might spread, you know, and get the press curious at that time. And they were trying to contain it. What was going on in Roswell, according to uh, the base public information, Walter, uh, public information officer Walter Hott, who in an affidavit that came out in 2007, is he said, Ramey, or not Ramey, excuse me, that uh, he was aware of the, them investigating this debris field northwest of town on July 7th when he got back to his office. But then later in the day, he heard that they had found a craft and body site north of town, closer into town, and had been discovered by civilians earlier that day. So back in Washington, Vandenberg has been informed of this, and so now they're really concerned you know, they have this craft and body side. We don't know exactly when, but so Vandenberg in the early afternoon is trying to kill this, this disc story down in Houston. And then at 2.30, he has a, a dental appointment, but he cancels it. And he goes out to the airport to personally 
greet uh, the Air, Army Air Force Secretary, Stuart Symington. And uh, that is very peculiar because he's out of his office, according to his log, for an hour and a half. Why would he go out and personally greet and bring Symington back to the Pentagon? Uh, and I think that's because at that point he was aware of what was happening, the new things that were happening in Roswell, and it was urgent business. So they couldn't wait for Symington to get back. He had to talk to him immediately. So he comes back and he goes, immediately goes into a meeting at the Pentagon with Symington. Just as he's getting back, Carl Hatch, who's one of the senators, uh, or is it Dennis Chavez, I forget. It may have been Dennis Chavez. Uh, he calls Truman at the White House. Actually, his son calls for him, but, and he requests a special meeting with Truman, which does take place uh, two days later, on July 9th in the morning. So what was that about? We don't know because, you know, there's nothing in, in the Truman's logs or anything like that that says what the meeting was about. But it's just very curious. There are all these coincidences going on. That's the thing. There are just dozens of little coincidences like this. So uh, Carl Hatch or Dennis Chavez is requesting this meeting with Truman. Uh, and then that's all we have for Vandenberg the next day, but the next morning is when things really hop are hopping, and then the public information officer, Walter Hott, says General Ramey had flown out to Roswell with his chief of staff, Colonel DeBose, who, who admitted that they, they staged a cover-up in, in Fort Worth, uh, and there was a morning meeting at 7.30 that morning, and they're, and they're discussing the two crash sites, uh, the debris is passed around for everybody to look at, and nobody knew what it was. And then General Ramey, they discussed whether the public should be told something, and Ramey says, no, we've decided to cover it up. And uh, Walter Hoth said, I think he was getting his orders from the Pentagon. So um, now what's interesting here is back in Washington at the Pentagon, uh, General Vandenberg cancels a previously scheduled meeting and he calls a two and a half hour meeting. This is at exactly the same time as, as this morning meeting in Roswell. He calls a two and a half hour meeting of the Joint Research and Development Board. And there's a whole backstory on the Joint Research and Development Board. This was a, um, uh, it was chaired by Dr. Vannevar Bush of the Car Carnegie Institute. It had been the nation's science research and development czar during World War II. He was one of the most important men in the government. And they did all the uh, military you know, research and development during the war. And then they, the Defense Department or the War Department set up this Joint Research and Development Board afterwards to continue that. And so he's in charge of that. Two and a half years later, uh, th these Canadian documents um, were written by a Canadian ra uh, radio engineer named Wilbert Smith and also from the Canadian Embassy in Washington uh, talking about a uh, super secret saucer study committee within the Research and Development Board headed by Dr. Vannevar Bush. Okay, so this is the same group. Uh, the Joint Research and Development Board three weeks later with the passage of the National Security Act became the Research and Development Board and Bush was appointed the first chair of that but he's still within the Research and Development Board in 1950 when uh, this Wilbert Smith was given this briefing in Washington saying the saucers are real, they're classified higher than the H-bomb, and this secret committee, you know, headed by Dr. Vannevar Bush within the Research and Development Board is looking into the modus operandi, you know, how, how the saucers work, basically. And then it says, and they're, they're also talking about mental aspects of the whole phenomenon, which is interesting. The, 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 uh, the Wilbert Smith memo, they mention these four things that he was briefed about, and then he says, uh, and we, there was also discussion about mental aspects of the flying saucers. And we don't know exactly what that means, but it could be referring to telepathic communications, which is very interesting, because I've never seen that in any other document. You know, of, of the thousands of UFO documents, I've never seen that mentioned. But they were talking about this in 1950. As, as to the paper trail with Roswell, basically there is none. But that's in itself curious because this was a huge news story. 
okay, uh, it, it tied up the phone lines in the Pentagon for an entire afternoon and into the evening. They got probably thousands of phone calls. The newspapers mentioned the phone lines into New Mexico and Texas being tied up. So this was a huge news story. It was headline news. Um, and yet there's no paper trail. You know, the Pentagon, it says Vandenberg right in the middle of this. This is about 45 minutes after the press release went out over the wire. He leaves his office. He goes to the Pentagon press room and personally handles the situation, directing calls to New Mexico and Texas. Now, okay, what's happening, guys? Like I said, if you didn't know, but but he, you know, he's putting on a show. Uh, but you think Vandenberg would be very upset with this? You know, I had to disrupt my schedule to deal with a weather balloon. I mean, there would be there would have been an investigation. How could you guys? you know, screw up that badly, misidentify a simple weather balloon. No investigation. There's no paper trail. The only government document that's ever been found in this was an FBI telegram that was written out of Dallas where they're called by one of the intelligence people, you know, at Fort Worth, and they said, oh, it's just a weather balloon and it's attached radar target. Uh, we're shipping it to right field uh, because uh, phone tele uh, conversations with them, they don't disagree. They disagree with the weather balloon story. They don't say why. They say, oh, we don't think it's a weather balloon. Well, that's because Colonel DeBose's chief of staff, uh, I mean, not Colonel DeBose, but General Ramey's chief of staff, Colonel DeBose, told us that Washington ordered a special flight of debris flown probably in July 6th when the rancher reported the crash. They wanted this debris flown to Washington. It was a super secret ship in a debris, and then it was flown onto Wright Field. So they'd already seen the debris. And I think that's why the FBI is told, or they talked to Wright Field, and Wright Field told the FBI, we don't think it's a weather balloon. Okay, so they say that, and the other interesting thing is uh, General Ramey said, oh, we've canceled the flight to Wright Field. It's just a weather balloon. Uh, <laughs> but the FBI is saying, no, we're shipping it off to Wright Field, and Wright Field doesn't think it's a weather balloon. Uh, 